Well, welcome to Victory Family Church. If you're new, welcome. Welcome all our Facebook friends. Uh, I was just sitting there reading some texts from you guys over in Africa. Thank you guys for watching. Um, we will be there soon. Continue to pray for us. Guys, um, we started a series several weeks back called Taking the Gloves Off, right? And when we take the gloves off, I'm going to go back to an original slide real quick just so I can read something. Um, that phrase, taking the gloves off, is a phrase which simply means to, uh, from this point forward, nothing's going to be held back. No restraint, no mercy will be shown. Against whom? Against the enemy. The enemy of your soul and mine and of all the souls that are out there. You know, I, I had to literally just probably 45 seconds ago stop and Papa probably saw me and I just... I just prayed out loud and said, God, give me a boldness today that's not rude, but give me a boldness that is firm and filled with your love. We, we, we are somehow um, missing the mark. And this may or may not be for you, but I can promise you it's for somebody in this room. If for nobody else, it's for me. We serve a God that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, most of us in this room will never prayerfully, never have to lose a child before you go home. I cannot imagine. I simply cannot. If you've walked that or know somebody that has, I can only say that I would, it would have to be God to get you through something like that. We make this whole gospel message a fairy tale sometimes and we tack it in with the Easter Bunny and Christmas and Santa Claus and, and any other fable as it were, but this is a true story. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Now, you may not fully comprehend the Trinity. I get it. That's one of those, you know, theology issues that can, can be tough to get your head wrapped around. But we literally do serve God the Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. God gave His Son Jesus, who showed up, born of a virgin woman, born of Mary, and He walked upon this earth being tempted, as Hebrews chapter 2 says, in every manner that you and I have been tempted, Yet he was found to be without sin. God understood that for us to have a relationship with him, there had to be an atonement for our sin. And that sin could be no other than his own son, Jesus, that came and successfully lived fully human, yet fully divine. He had to make choices just like you and I have to make. Yet every single time, that he was tempted to do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, whatever, he chose to do what was right. Yeah. And he did that so that you and I might have forgiveness of sin and an eternal relationship with him. Yes. As we can never lose sight of what this gospel message is. But in light of God our Father giving his only son, Friends, there's a weightiness to that that we need to revisit in our own hearts. This is not, hey, good man upstairs, and we'll score a touchdown and, and toss him a few. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear my big cross. I'm going to talk about it, but I'm not going to live it. Amen. See, where the boldness needs to come in for me, and I'm going to preach to myself today, there has to be a fear of the Lord in understanding who he is. I would dare say that most of us in this room had, we had a deeper revelation of the goodness and the mercy of our God. We would not have just so haphazardly and so freely entered into whatever sin may have tripped you up at some point in your walk with Christ. And we've all been there because why? The Bible tells us that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So you're in the right place. None in this room is better than the other. Certainly not I. But what I know is, is that time is drawing nigh unto conclusion. 
I don't, I don't know how to put that. I can, I can hear some of the, the older ones in the church that I grew up in talking about this, and it just didn't make sense. I couldn't connect the dots. Okay, this is all going to wrap up somehow. You know, God's going to come back. You know, I, I just didn't get it until I got it. And now that I've got it, I'm not going to turn it loose. And I'm just going to be real frank with you. If all of you leave and I start over with a whole new bunch, I promise you I'm going to preach this gospel until I die. And I'm going to preach it where it's hot, and I'm going to preach it where it's heavy, and I'm going to preach it where you understand that this is real life. Some of you in the room may not choose to go see a movie that's currently out in the theaters, and I understand there's a little language in it. The Sounds of Freedom is a, is a message that I personally believe is one that the church needs to, at some point, visit. There, there's evil in the world, amen? I mean, anybody here ever been wrapped up into the evil of, of what Satan's trying to do, which is simply steal, kill, and to destroy, and he's very good at what he does. You know, for me, it was a cocaine overdose January 26, 1998 that, that just kind of woke me up. Can't say that I was perfect the next day. Truth be known, I rolled over, rolled a big old fat joint, smoked it, went out on the porch. Amen. Something happened to me that day, though. I couldn't get high. As God is my witness, the, 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 the sky was bluer, the grass was greener, the air was fresher. I even tried to go back out into the party scene that night. And I got there, my boys are yelling at me from the front porch, Dur, we thought you were dead. I said, I thought I was. I took two steps thinking I'm going right back into that lifestyle, forgetting what had just happened, and I ran into an invisible wall. As God is my witness, you don't have to believe it. Here's, here, here's what I know. I was there, you weren't. As I, as I hit this wall, I knew that I knew that I knew that I could not go back into that house. I got back in my car, and you might say, well, son, you weren't saved. Well, you can say what you want to say, but I can tell you that I did stop by the convenience store. I picked up a pack of smokes. I picked up a six-pack, and I went to the house. I sat on that couch, and I thought, what has happened to me? I was in a little studio apartment, Drake Northbrook apartment. You know them well. I'm sitting there, and I'm going, what has happened you would think that the night before would be such a revelatory experience that I would just automatically go, thank you, Jesus, I know what happened. But the enemy had already blinded me that quick. But the Lord gave me a simple revelation. I'm here. You prayed to me. You asked me for help. That was my prayer of salvation. I don't know that I theologically did it right, but I asked for help. I said, God, I need help. Now, I'd asked for help before get me through the night so I could go back and do it again type help. This night it was a help that I need help. And my father, who so loved this world of which I was a part of, yes. sent his son that I might receive the said help I was asking for. Yes. Now, with the context of that, with the heart of this message being that we're taking the gloves off. We're going to show no more mercy, no more restraints going to be shown to the enemy. You may have missed it this morning. Lord knows I've shown up at church and gotten behind a pulpit having had a blow-up fight in the car. Nobody else has done that, I know. But I, for one, have done that. I'm not proud of that. But I'm just telling you, it's tough when you miss the mark and then you have to go and stand and proclaim to God. Now, I didn't have that this morning. It's been a long, long time since we've had any of those moments. Amen. Praise Amen. God for that. Amen. But I stand here this morning with, a, with, with, with a, a something rising up within me, a boldness to just tell you the truth. Reagan, we're going down to slide 40, uh, 49, I believe it is. We've looked at three solicitations to sin. We've talked about the world, the flesh, and today we're going to look at the devil. These are very general messages. When I talked about the world, we looked at the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. 
the flesh, things that tempt us. But many of us don't want to talk about the supernatural element of an adversary of your soul and mine. His name's Lucifer, Satan, the devil. He's real. And he sincerely wants to rip you from the kingdom of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Stay alert. That's what it says in the New Living Translation. Picking it up in the Amplified, you'll see that it says sober, clear-headed, self-controlled, vigilant, on the lookout for possible danger. That's vigilance. You understand that the Bible's asking you to be sober, to be watchful, keep an eye out. Look for what the enemy is doing. See, we have people that it was just said up here earlier, I'm not going to look at the devil. I don't want to talk about him. I don't want to deal with him. He's already defeated, so I don't have to deal with him anymore. That is false teaching. The enemy hates you, and he will trip you up. Some of you in this room have been tripped up. We don't have to start airing out dirty laundry, but most of us in this room, we've missed it at some point or the other. I wish I could say I got saved and man, it just all turned to, you know, glory. But it didn't. It got tougher. Because now I had to contend with and deal with not only my fleshly desires, but an adversary, a real uh, uh, enemy that is as alive as you and I. And he was coming for me. Friends, there was a bullseye that got placed upon my back. Stay alert, sober, clear-headed, self-controlled, vigilant, on the lookout for possible danger. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. For some of you, you know, for some of you athletic ones, if you stay in this church long enough, I just have to go back to that. It's what I know. We practiced every week to play on Friday night. We didn't play on Friday night and win a big game and then go, hey, well, I guess we're good until next Friday night. No. We were in there watching film. We were in there trying to dissect what the enemy was going to do to try to stump us, to beat us, to gain victory. And then we would go and practice, and we would practice, and we would practice. Coach, do you ever tell an offensive lineman to turn your guy out? Did you ever have to tell him more than once? Why? Because they forget. Turn the guy out. A defensive end has one job. Turn him in. Turn him in. Some of y'all are like, what are you even talking about? (laughs) I'm just telling you, we need to know the basics, the 101s of anything you do in life. You don't just do it once and like, oh, that's over with. No, we need to study what our adversary is doing. And you say, I've heard this before. Some of you heard it at the 9 o'clock hour in Sunday school because my son, Pastor Calvary, did an outstanding job utilizing this very same scripture. Everybody wants happiness. Nobody wants pain. But you can't have a rainbow without a little rain. Y'all have heard that before. Finally, somebody say finally. Finally. Be strong. The Bible's not asking you to be weak. Now, friends, listen to me. Take this, and if it hits you right here, let it hit. Quit being weak. Quit being weak. Guys, this is, this is that boldness coming out in just a second. I'm going to say something that could, could sound rough, but I don't intend it to. I'm tired of looking at the body of Christ and watching people over and over and over. Stumble, fall, go backwards. Stumble, fall, go backwards. Stumble, fall, go backwards. When is it going to take root? I mean, at what point it, has sin ever satisfied you? When have you gone back and go, you know what, maybe I'll just take another drink. 
Maybe I'll slide another peel. Maybe I'll watch it one more time. Maybe it'll be different this time. It's never different. The enemy always, always, always is trying to steal your peace and steal your joy and steal your effectiveness in the kingdom of God. And we have an impotent church right now. We got people crying about, some of y'all might exit in about two and a half seconds. Some people are still crying about whether a man or a woman can speak behind a pulpit. Are you kidding me? Mary carried the word of God for nine months. Now they can't speak. We're going to let them teach little kids. We're going to let them teach the teenagers. We're going to let them teach the ladies. But because it's a man, we can't teach them. Guys, I'm just saying, please stop all the pettiness. We got denominations that are splitting right now over a very basic sin problem. Homosexuality is not of God any way you want to cut it. Does it mean that we hate them? That we're going to go out and start stoning those that are homosexual? No. By God means no. We're going to love them. We're going to hate the sin. But I sure as heck ain't going to have them in leadership of this church. I'm not going to have them behind this pulpit. I'm not going to advocate the lifestyle that is absolutely the antithesis of what God desires. So where's the church that's going to raise up? Now, we like to hide behind Facebook walls. I I get it. I've done it. Man, I'll throw that truth out there on Facebook. But we cower down sometimes. And if that's not you, don't take it on. But finally, the Bible tells us, be strong in the Lord. In the Lord. In the Lord. And in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If there's anyone in this room that has yet to settle the fact that the enemy is still alive and well and still coming after you, Please grab a hold of this word, take it to heart, and know that, yes, there's a billion other things that we can talk about, about the goodness and the love and the mercy of heaven. But if we don't understand that you have an adversary, then we're going to continue to stumble and fall, stumble and fall. And and just, there's people backsliding every day. Six schemes of the devil we're going to look at today. Man, there's about another billion that we could preach on today, but I'm going to look at six. Number one... The enemy wants us to doubt God. He'd love for you and I to live in fear. He'd love for us to feel insecure. Lord knows. He loves for us to neglect the church. He'd like to lead us astray. Another scheme of the devil is that he wants you to fail. So let's take these in order this morning and I'm not going to keep you too long. Then he said to Thomas, John chapter 20, verses 27 through 29, he said to Thomas, put your finger right here and look at my hands. Friends, this is Thomas, one of the disciples. Thomas that walked with, talked with, ate with, slept with. He was with Jesus in his presence throughout the three and a half years of ministry he did upon the earth. And yet, he still doubted. That didn't even hardly make sense. And yet he was right there. He saw the miracles, the blinded eyes open. He saw the dead raised. He saw the cripples walk. He saw this, and yet there was doubt in him as to who this Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, truly was. Then he said to Thomas, he being Jesus, said to Thomas, put your fingers right here and look in my hands. This is after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Some of y'all need to grab a hold of this word for your life today. Quit doubting God. He is who he says he is. He'll do what he said he'll do. Well, I had a bad experience with God. Okay, I get it. You you, you had an expectation that God was going to do this or do that. He didn't do it. He didn't meet your standard. Well, if you read the entirety of the word, you'll understand that his ways aren't our ways. His timing's not your timing. 
He has a bigger plan that he's working out that you and I, there is, listen, I don't know, maybe I'm in my own boat here, but there's a a little gray area to God. Everybody wants it to be black and white, and it, it is. But to me, I'm like, okay, God, I don't understand some things. Mysteries. There's mysteries in God. That's a good word. It's a good way to put it. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe, exclamation point. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Everybody, even to this day, even in that day, this day, everybody wants a sign. Show me something, God. He shows you something every day that you wake up. But by faith, you've got to understand that it's him that's waking you up. You don't have to believe that. That's your, it's your prerogative. I choose to believe when I wake up, it's because God has something for me this day. If I go home tonight, I've got to make a six-hour drive to Nashville here in about an hour. No guarantee I'll make it home. I'm just being frank. I don't want that. My family doesn't want it. Hopefully you don't want it. But the reality is people die every day from crazy stuff. Things we can't get our head around. Is God somehow bad? Because bad things happen to good people? Mm -mm. He's not. A.B. Simpson said, When we dare to depend entirely upon God and do not doubt, the humblest and feeblest agencies will become mighty through God to pull down strongholds. When we depend entirely upon God, I'm asking you this morning, as we look at the schemes of the devil, this one being doubting God, can we flip the script and say, you know what, God, I'm going to choose to trust you with all my heart. No longer am I going to lean upon my own understanding or that of the Internet. We got some Internet theologians out there today, trust me. I read it on the Internet, it must be true. Well, you just don't know what's really going on. Friend, you don't think the enemy's working through that internet? I promise you he is. You better stick with that word. You better line it up with the word of God. Well, I can't make it all fit in the word of God. That's why it's called faith. You don't have to believe. But if you're going to believe, there's going to be some mysteries that you don't fully understand just yet. But here's what I know about God. In due time, he brings understanding that only he can give. Another scheme of the devil is he'd love for us to live in fear. Psalms 34, 4. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Either he did or he didn't. Here's that black and white in God. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Well, that's great for him, but he hadn't done that for me. I hear it. Maybe you've said it. I've said it. But you've got to get to a place, listen to me church and hear me closely, you have to get to a place where you choose not to be the king of your own life. You have to bow your knee to one that is greater than thee and say, Lord, I don't understand it just yet, but I believe. I believe that you've heard my prayers as I ask you to free me from my fears, and you did. Amen. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit unto fear, but rather one of power and of love and of a sound mind. Right. Pastor Calvary this morning talked about the authority that we have. Friends, it's not what you think is right. It's what the written word says is right. And there are times when the enemy is coming against you and he's trying to bring fear upon you. Some of you that have dealt with this said fear, you understand all too well that you just want it to go. Can I tell you there's one remedy? It's to confess the word and tell, speak to the adversary of your soul and say, you know what? My God didn't give me a spirit unto fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you, Satan, are under my feet 
And so you will leave now in Jesus' name. If you don't want to say that, well, that's just not me. Well, then live in fear. I don't know how else to help you. Open your mouth and speak. Well, we're not supposed to talk to the devil. Well, Jesus certainly did. Wake up and fight for what you believe. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Somebody say the next one. I fear no evil. Even though I might be walking through a literal valley that is filled with all kind of death, I'm not going to fear that which is evil. Why? Because the word says I don't have to. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I don't have anybody. Nobody's with me. I'm all alone. No, no, you're wrong. You listen, that's a lie from the pit of hell. You all, if you're a believer, if you have sold out to your Savior, He's always with you. And here, here's, here, listen, He's promised never to leave you. That's right. Nor will He ever forsake you. Come on. I might leave you. I might forsake you. God will never. That's right. He will never, never, never yeah. leave you or forsake you. Too many people are thinking of security instead of opportunity. They seem to be more afraid of life than they are of death. What does that mean? Jesus understood that he had a purpose and a mission as he walked upon this earth. He gave a great commission. Hey, you don't have to do this by yourself, but I'm giving you all authority in heaven and upon the earth. Now, I need you to go and make disciples. They understood their mission. There's not a unit in our United States military that has ever left for war that didn't understand exactly what they were called to do. And if they did find themselves in a place where they didn't understand, then you had all kind of chaos and anarchy. Just telling you, some of y'all that lived through the Vietnam War, you understand. Some of you fought, and you're like, what are we doing? What, what are we doing here? What is our purpose? What is our mission Friends, some of you are sitting here right now today and you still don't know what your calling or mission is in life. You're waiting for this next great epiphany from God to write it in the heavens of the sky. And I'm telling you, every day your calling, your calling for every one of you in this room is to pursue him. So don't tell me I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, you do. You're pursuing God. Because in your pursuit of God, he will drop a nugget in your life and all of a sudden, he will put you on a mission that you never thought you'd be on. We're going to uh, a a place called the Challenge Farm. One of our stops in Africa, Job actually was uh, one of the young men that was raised there, him and his sister Elizabeth on the Challenge Farm. And Mama Sherry left a teaching position in the United States of America. She went on a very simple missions trip to Africa later on in life. And she was so gripped with these kids, these street kids that are sitting on the corners trying trying their best to raise themselves because their parents are addicted to glue or some other kind of substance. You say, glue, what is that? They have a big shoe factory over here in Katali where we're going. A lot of the people get sniffing this glue, and you'll see kids, that's all they know to do is they'll have a bottle, literally holding it in their mouth, and they'll sniff glue. Well, she was so gripped with a simple missions trip, she came home, she quit everything, sold everything, and moved to Africa and started the challenge farm. And now hundreds, if not thousands, and probably more in line with tens of thousands of young kids have had the proper nutrition and education to be raised up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord so that they too could go and do something for God's kingdom. Because why? One person in their pursuit of God all of a sudden had a little nugget dropped in their heart. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. What do you mean? She wasn't 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and she had it all figured out? No. She was a teacher. She thought that was it. God had a different mission. Some of y'all are sitting here right now, and you're going to look back. If you choose to, you're going to look back one day and go, wow. 
I had no idea God had this for me. Too many people are thinking of security instead of the opportunity at hand. They seem to be more afraid of life than they are of death. Feeling insecure is another scheme of the devil. God saved you by his grace. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Somebody needs to hear that. We are, or rather, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. Guys, some of you would do well to write that scripture down and go and meditate upon it. What does it mean to meditate? Think on it. Ask God about it. Talk to him. God, what is it? What are these said works that you have for me to do? See, I got a little news flash. This is not about you just going and passing out a card and inviting somebody to put their little park their butt right here in church. This is not what this is about. If you want that, there's 50 others you pass getting to this one. And I'm not saying that that's what they're doing, but there's a lot of people that they think all they got to do, I said a little prayer, I'm going to park my little self here, that I'm going to play golf, I'm going to eat at the country club, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. They don't care about what God's kingdom. And I'm telling you that God has a kingdom, the king's domain. And Jesus is the king. You're not. I'm not. So if you're going to be in this church, you're going to hear this from time to time. What are you doing to advance God's kingdom? Dr. Larry, can I use you? Dr. Larry, and for that matter, Miss Andre as well, are trained, licensed. Dr. Larry, obviously, doctor took them a minute to get there they didn't just give you that did they okay i missed out if they passed those out that is a noble and a very admirable profession to counsel people both of them do it and do it effectively and do it well and have helped countless numbers of people And if they went to their grave and that's all they did, it would have been a noble endeavor, without a doubt. However, at some point, it happens to be in the lifetime that that, that we've known each other, God shared some things with them, and all of a sudden, they are now at least a little part of what they do here at Victory Family Church, it's really a big part, is, is the drama. And you may say, well, what's a drama? Let me tell you something. The drama is allowing somebody to get this very same message that I'm preaching, but it's, it's presented in a totally different format. Wow. I've tasked him recently. You can pray for him. I've tasked him to write a full-blown screenplay. Yep. If the Kendrick brothers can do it, why can't we? Amen. He saved you by his grace when you believed. But if you read back down there in verse 10, he has created us anew in Christ so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. What if we get to the other side of glory? We pass from this life to the next. See, I don't believe that God's going to spend a whole lot of time judging our sin. He dealt with that at the cross. And when you believe, your sins are atoned for. Thank God for it. You can't earn it. It's a blessing through his blood. You receive it and just carry on. But what if, and I believe it is going to be this way, what if we get there and we don't really know him? That's one thing. But what about, he says, son, look at, you know, let's, let's play a little prices, right? Behind door number three over here, I had all this for you to do. This is my Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 right here. This, this is your door. And you look at it and you're like, wow, I didn't know I could have done all of that. No, you couldn't have. But if you had asked me, you and I together in the commission, we could have done this together. Now, you put that shoe on and let it it fit right where you're at. I'm just asking you, what is it that you're doing, you, that you are doing to advance the kingdom of God? You might say, well, why are you talking about works? Because Jesus talked about works. Not unto salvation. Don't hear what I'm not saying but works that he prepared for you and I to do before time began.
began. I don't believe that. You don't have to. Jeremiah 17, 7, verse 7 and 8. 17, verse 7 and 8. I don't think I have that one on the screen, but it's okay. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. They are like trees planted along a river brink with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by the long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Who are these leaves that never stop producing fruit? Those that trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. That's who. You want to produce fruit all the time? You know, Jesus was actually quoting here, way over there when he spoke to the tree, cursed it. You'll never produce fruit again. There's a whole lot of depth to that. I believe he's even reminded of this time period right here. Those that will put their hope and confidence in him will produce fruit always. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how hot it gets in life. It does not matter. What matters is, is that your hope and your confidence is in the Lord. Because if it is, he gives you a promise. Their leaves will stay green and they will never stop producing fruit. Leave that there. Let y'all meditate upon that. Insecurity. That's what we're talking about, feeling insecure. All of those scriptures should give us confidence, should give, should give us the security that, hey, he saved us and he's got something for me to do. That should give you a security, not an insecurity. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord have made, their hope, uh, made the Lord their hope and their confidence. That should give you security that you're going to produce fruit all the days of your life because you put your hope and your confidence in the Lord. So don't walk around insecure. Be secure in who God has made you to be. Yeah. <laughs> Some of y'all would love this, and I don't know that I'm going to go through it because I didn't put it in my notes as far as for you to see, but they're in mine. Seven toxic things about insecure people. They're overly concerned about what other people think of them. Now, i got to be a little transparent. Well, we're driving down to Graceville yesterday. Me and Kim were discussing some things, and I kind of blurted out, and it was truthful from my heart. And I stand by it today. I'm kind of getting over what, what any of you might think of me. Amen. <laughs> I, lived in, I, I lived in a place of torment for many, many years of worrying about what somebody thought of me. You may have never dealt with that. I did. But I'm kind of at a place now. Hmm. Jill, getting in your boat. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't, I, I don't care. You don't like me? That's fine. I want you to love Jesus, but you ain't got to like me. Amen. I might say some things moving forward that's going to say, wow, he really just don't care what I think anymore. No, I don't. <laughs> they never express a firm opinion. People that have known me well, i.e. my wife, will tell you that because I was an insecure person, I never could express a firm opinion. True? She can. She's secure. Listen to me. She found her security in Jesus a long time ago. Much, much uh, earlier than I did. You want to talk about why we had marital disagreements early on in our marriage? Because we were two insecure people, like most of you that have been married in this room. Perhaps you've even been divorced in this room. If you really look back, you're probably going, well, you know what? We were probably both insecure, probably just made a bunch of dumb decisions. You know, it probably could have worked out had we had Jesus anywhere in the marriage. Amen. They suffer from chronic inability to make decisions even when the choices have little to no consequence. You know, you know I'm chuckling because this is so me. Just be, it was, thank you. This was who I was. They frequently try to change the direction of projects and meetings. They put other people down to make themselves look more important. Now, I've never done that, thank God. The Lord knows I've been around some people. They constantly talk about how busy they are when they're actually not to show that they are in demand. They are paranoid meddlers who make you question your every move. Insecure people. 
That's the scheme of the devil is to play, keep you in a place of insecurity. Because as long as you're not secure in who you are in Christ, that means you have placed your identity in something other than Christ. And how could you ever fulfill all that God has for you? You can't. So it's a scheme of the devil. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? No. Question mark. No. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or that we're persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death. As the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. There's a refrigerator verse for you. Another scheme of the devil. We're getting ready to close here. Neglect the church. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm for God. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I stated earlier that I believe that the day of his return is drawing near. The last thing you and I need to do is to neglect our meeting together. Wear that if it fits. To be led astray, another scheme of the devil. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but really are vicious wolves. You can identify them by what? Their fruit. That is, by the way that they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. This is Jesus' words, not mine. Amen. Do you have a pantry full of good fruit? Is your fruit ready and ripe? Is it, is it, able to, is it edible to those around you? What is this fruit that is spoken of? Well, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, fruit, manifested in several different things here. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Go back over that list. Check out your fruit pantry when you leave here today. Do I have love? Am I walking in love? Do I have joy? Do people see joy? Is there peace in my life? My father-in-law used to tell me, son, if we could ever get people to just live out the first three, we'd change the world. Love, joy, and peace. A little sidebar, peace comes when you have security in Christ. Amen. And lastly, for you to fail. And I emphasize you. See, you might think, well, the enemy doesn't really care about me because I'm not really doing anything anyway. No, no, no. He wants to keep you neutralized so that you don't do anything for him. Are y'all listening to me this morning? We good? He wants you. He being the enemy. This is a scheme of the devil. The sixth one that we're discussing today. We could talk about 2,600. But the sixth one today is that he desires for you to fail. To fail in life, meaning not have money, not have a car, not have a house. Well, you know, that's, that's the least of his worries. He does not want you to grab a hold of who you are in Christ so that you fulfill the plans that God has created for you. We are pressed on every side by our troubles, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. The enemy wants us to fail, but good news, our Father wants us to succeed. Now stand to your feet with me today. The enemy is constantly working. For some of you that have been Walking this out for any length of time with a genuine pursuit of Christ by a show of hands, 
does this bear witness that the enemy is using these schemes against you? I'll raise both of mine. Look around the room. Keep them up if that's you. Look around the room. If you're brand new to this, I'm telling you, some of the folks in here have been walking this out a lot longer than I have. And I'm just here to tell you the enemy does not stop. You might say, I wish he would. And he will one day when we cross from this life to the next. But it ain't today. If you got breath in your body, then you got purpose in your life. You might say, well, I want to find a deeper purpose in God. Well, I got good news for you. God's here today. And he wants to give you your purpose. Some of you have got hard choices in front of you. It's just the truth. Some of you, because your security is attached to what you do, right? Some of you have got a presentation into the world of success. You really don't want to give that up. I get it. And God may not be asking you to. Don't hear what I'm not saying this morning. I'm telling you that if you have this in your gut, there's something more. And you know that you know that, hey, I've given my life to Christ and I know there's something more. You know what these are right here? In the spirit, this is an altar. Stares to you and I, to the natural eye, but it's an altar. And what happens on an altar? Something what? Dies. There's a sacrifice that is made. Now, some of you need to come to these altars today because there's something in you that needs to die. <laughs> I probably need to answer my own altar calls even more, but I can promise you in the beginning, I would preach and then I'd go to the altar. Forget praying about you guys. I was going to the altar because I had preached. God spoke through me and I'm convicted. I'm going, God, help me. But I can tell you right now that there's still more for Jason Duran to do and for Kim Duran and our children to do. But right now, we know that we're walking in the perfect will of God being the pastors of this church. We know that. I hope that you know that as a part of this family of God, together, there's a purpose for Victory Family Church. Now, we've kind of coined the phrase, and I believe it to be a mission of God, and that is one more soul. You're going to walk out of here today. Some of you are going to be privileged to have the opportunity to be able to go eat. As much as you want to leave a track, you better leave some money. Well, I don't want to give them my money because they're probably going to use drugs. Well, that's none of your business. Tip them good. And don't be rude. Lord knows, I worked at Piccadilly when I was in Bible school when I remember telling Pastor Kim, I don't want to, anybody know I'm in Bible school. I just want to go and be you know, kind of a regular person, just observe what's going on. I get there to the Piccadilly in Pensacola, Florida. I'm working the lines. Man, I'm scooping out black-eyed peas and whatever else. Man, it was a great first two days. Friday and Saturday. I said, hey, it's pretty good. They asked me, how's your job going? I said, I like it. Pretty cool. I mean, I was working with some, shame, I mean, some people. They said, we well, just wait till tomorrow. I said, what happens tomorrow? They said, well, the church folks will be here. And I thought, what do they do? They won't tip. They will literally cuss us if we don't do it just the way they want it. And they will demand service without giving anything in return. And I remember thinking, okay, I got there. And when little Mr. Johnny cussed me from the other side because I didn't scoop him enough black-eyed peas, I thought, hmm, I don't think you and I are serving the same Jesus. I wish my drill instructor, Sergeant Drone, would watch this one day. I don't even know if he's still alive. See, in the Marine Corps, it may have been this way in the Army, Navy, all I can speak for is the Marine Corps. Paris Island, every now and again, they'd say, ladies, no offense. They'd say, ladies, we're about to get down to fighting we. We didn't get called men until we graduated. Y'all can take offense to that. Some of you probably will. 
Here's what I found about offended people. Any offense will do. Doesn't matter how big or small, any offense will do. Ladies, we're about to get down to fighting way. And I'll look to you today and I'll say, ladies and gentlemen in this room, we're about to get down to fighting way. We're about to gather a group of people in this room that are going to get serious about prayer. They're going to get serious about doing something for the Lord. And you're doing something. It's going to take on a whole lot of different forms because there's many gifts. Don't think for a second that I'm telling you everybody pack your bags we're all going to Africa. No, because you ain't all called. Some of you are called to send people. Use your resources. Some of you, tomorrow, you're going to go on your job with a different outlook. Say, I need, to, I need to talk about Jesus to these people. I need to show them love. Preach the gospel and use words if you must. We're about to get down to fight and wait in this room. I'm telling you, there's a people that are gathering here that's going to drive the roots as deep and as far as we can get them. Because we're going to be so strong when that enemy comes. When, when he comes, y'all think we're finished sifting? We're not finished sifting. You or may or may not be here two months from now. I don't know. That's your choice, your call. You better do what the Lord tells you to do. If this ain't your flavor, this ain't where you want to sign up for and go somewhere else, it's fine. I'll love you going out the door as I will coming in the door. But if you're serious, then you're going to leave out of here today and you're not going to wave the banner of Victory Family Church. You're going to wave the banner of Jesus Christ. And you're going to go out there and you're going to shine a light so bright that people are going to come to you and say, what is it about you? And you're going to give them the hope. The only hope there is, and that's Jesus Christ. If you need to find your place down on these altars, then maybe you don't know what your purpose is. Maybe you don't know what your calling is. Maybe you got struggles that you're still dealing with. It's okay. I promise you it is okay. Well, I'm still struggling with this, that, and the other. Most of them are just fleshly little sins. Everybody gets all uptight about it. Well, I'm still struggling smoking. Okay, fine. Come down here. And if you want to get rid of it, get rid of it. If you don't, don't. But I'm telling you, if you want to, it's available. Well, I'm still struggling with pills. Then come down here and get along with God and say, God, I'm still struggling popping pills. I've done it. I had to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm struggling. You got addiction, as Pastor Calvary's been talking about, whether it's pornography or something else, get it out in the open and come to God. You don't have to air it out to me, but you need to tell God, I'm here to do business with you. And if this is a place that you want to dig in and say, Lord, we're going to do something, then I promise you this, you better change what time you come to church because you won't find a seat before too long. Y'all raise both hands in this room. Father, I thank you for these, your warriors. No gender in the spirit, warriors in this room. Men, women, children in this house, we're going to be warriors for the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every heart in this room. And if there's something that they need to deal with, may they do it with you. May they come to these altars and allow something to die that needs to die. Church, if you would, forget about the time just for a moment, but the worship team is going to play. If you're in this room and you need to do some business with God, run to these altars and do business with them because He loves you beyond your wildest imagination. Church, worship God as people come to do business with God.